In the age of sail, we once were rooted. For 5,000 years, it constituted a world-shaping, epoch-making, record-breaking, human-being technology. This cannot be disputed. From the time of the pharaohs to the first steamboats, if you wanted to move some goods, some goats, send a scientific treatise about the sexual life of moats, fight a war against a foreign nation, take your kids on a round-the-world vacation, to move anything across the seas, your only hope was for a sail upon a boat upon the breeze. Only a fool would row, could bear to go that slow, if they were in the know. Now, don't get me wrong. I imagine a case where a captain of reason could, without treason, reason rowing over reason. I sometimes prefer a book in my hands to bits on a screen. It seems a good book may help my mind dream. And the slow, dirty gravel of the path less traveled seems not to unravel the work of the travel, but gives a sense of joy to a boy and a girl with nowhere to go and time to get gone. But when the task that's at hand, like yours, is so grand, and the mission your addition has frisson, when you're jissing, why rub? Why bow low? You must stand. Because today, here's our planet, a hot packed piece of granite. World's on fire, and we fan it. It's in trouble. We must jam it. We must man and woman it, not spam it with old tools that waste time, lame deeds that don't rhyme. Why wield a small hammer when you can jammer with a rammer? Why have a museum so you can see them, be them, getting foolish pride from taking small strides? Your inside museum guides giving tiny little rides through hoity-toity halls of art-filled walls and empty spaces filled with cases telling stories about the evolution of the races while the masses, the brilliant masses, all the classes, wait outside. That's not a museum. That's a mausoleum. Well, I do love art. It fills the cart in the quickie mart of my happy heart. The coffee table babble ain't no fable. Dance and music keep me stable. To a soul beyond the pale, there's nothing finer than a science center model whale. But if the whale don't scale, it's a planetary fail. We must scale. We can scale. We can move new ideas across the seas. <laughs> Because it's not just a rumor that the consumer ain't no dumb boomer with no hands, heart, or sense of humor. She's a smart, caring soul. She's got friends they can roll a trillion hours a year of civic action surplus on your ass. Shirky told me this is so. Take it. Go. No longer passive. Network hands, hearts, and voices now are massive. Network action makes old school broadcast reaction a distraction to this powerful new faction. Six billion people connected on the web. They'll tag your bits, hit your hits, grind your grits, pop your zits, give you fits, and take you to the Ritz. Solve your problems, make them theirs. Take away a thousand planetary cares. Cure your ulcer, hack your culture. Your museum should be theirs for the taken. You exist to maximize their making. Be assured that old boy taboos they are breaking. A fine new recipe they're delighted to be baking. They are insane, in the brain, with the freedom and power of creative commons in the public domain. Remix in a fresh refrain with their friends, a new Zooniverse, a new Universe. It's the opposite of holding still or moving in reverse. It's perverse how they rehearse the inverse of the ancient 20th century manager's chapter and verse about who gets a say, who does the work, and who just has to walk along silent behind the corporate content hearse. Flicker. It reached 9 billion culture-richer pictures. Open street maps in Ushahidi, and if my grandma could only see me, use 20 million CC0 records on Europeana to see, be, and make a vibrant culture. Like a cultural scientific new media data mixer mulcher, a grower, reader, seeder, super dynamic knowledge breeder beater who brings good things to Wikipedia. <laughs> That wiki really loves to show the people what they love to know. 
about the Himalayan snow, Madonna's brand new bow, Homer Simpson's dough. Where else are you going to get that, bro? A museum? I don't think so. So, Jack the Museum. We really need to make it scale, make it sail, so the culture continues to feed you. Do it now. Don't waste time. Working back in stagnant, small scale, small vision times. Do the museum. Thanks. <laughs>
unless it returns 10 times better performance than the last one. 10 times better performance. Um, he said, every 10 times improvement lets us see 10 times farther back to the beginning of the universe. That seems worth doing, <laughs> frankly. And this is a, a simulation. Um, that's before 10 times improvement, and that's after 10 times improvement. That's fairly significant. So I'm going to play fast and loose with numbers for a little bit to make a point about scale and ambition, I think. Let's make some graphs. An x, y axis, you're all familiar with that. Uh, every horizontal line is 10 million human beings, and the x axis tick marks are a year in time. That's the attendance of the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. for the last 33 years. Negative 1% growth over 33 years. Pretty much a flat line. And, and just to drive the point farther home, above that line is people who don't visit or haven't visited the National Gallery of Art, and then down below is people who do. And as the business, well, you know, that could be okay depending on your mission, but how you feel about that in your gut really depends on, on what you think the mission of that institution is and how you feel about scale. Uh, the business proverb is that there's a lot of room at the top. There's a lot of room at the top. Think about 10 time improvement. So here's, here's a modest Project X. Project X starts at 4.6 million visitors a year where the National Gallery of Art started in 1978, and it just adds 10% every year. That's a regular business. I think regular, if you don't, if a, if a publicly traded organization doesn't improve its results 10% a year, the board of directors gets fired, the stockholders, that's really modest. But look at the difference. You know, I think we have to zoom out to really get a look at that. Um, so let's adjust the vertical scale. Uh, and now each line represents 100 million breathing, loving human beings. Um, and it, as a fact, after 33 years, 10% annual growth gives you 102 million more visitors a year. That's a lot of people. Um, there's another number. Wikipedia unique visits. Hmm. Let's adjust. Let's zoom out again. So now every tick mark is a billion people. Uh, and the, the, the National Gallery of Art attendance recedes down into the soil. It sort of it's, it's becomes... Um, but oops, I made a mistake. That's not Wikipedia unique visits a year, that's Wikipedia unique visits a month. So let's normalize that data. I'm just sort of, I'm just going to multiply the monthly uniques by 12 to, to see where we get. Okay. It's kind of, kind of interesting. <laughs> um, that's the growth in uh, internet users. 34% of the world's population currently has some reliable access to the internet. Um, 2.4 billion internet users today, 4.6 million National Gallery of Art visitors. There's a lot of room at the top. A 2.395 billion person <laughs> difference a year. And again, how you feel about that depends on what you think the mission of that organization is and how you feel about scale. And also how you feel about the urgency of this particular moment on this particular planet. Um, but when Organizations like the National Gallery of Art, which I love, I love that institution, I love that building, um, but when they forged their dreams, you couldn't conceive of even a passive audience of 2.4 billion people, let alone an army of potential collaborators, a read-write pipe. It, you, it was not conceivable, so it was not part of the dream foundry. That's a little creepy. I'm not going to use that term again. Um, <laughs> um, but it most clearly is now. That, that kind of scale is just so obvious now. Um, it's, it's hardly even worth mentioning, but I'm trying to lay down a rhythm track in a way that we can do something with later. So um, the, the American football broadcasters were very proud this year after the Super Bowl. They had 108 million, 108.4 million viewers for that Super Bowl. It was a record-breaking audience. Uh, Gangnam Style, last time I checked, had 1.3 billion views. <laughs> and it keeps growing. It keeps on going. Uh, and there's an interesting backstory, probably most of you are familiar with, uh, that Psy has earned $8 million, more or less, in, in passive ad revenues from giving away that YouTube video. And he chose 
to walk away from <coughs> copyright infringements, people doing, I mean, the first one I saw was the Thai Navy did a Gangnam Style thing, which just goes on and on and on and on. Um, he chose not, and, and look at the bounty that arguably he got as a result of that $8 million of revenue, and it's, that still goes on and on. And Tim O'Reilly wrote, uh, before the Psy episode, a really interesting observation about uh, the, the, the gift economy and YouTube. Uh, he said, with hundreds of millions of viewers, these bands are now media companies. It seems to me that the potential of YouTube to be a game changer for the, me in the media marketplace, a powerful new channel and business model for artists, is still not widely understood. That's very consistent of Tim O'Reilly and very true, clearly. Uh, and then there's these guys. Um, you all probably know this story, and I'm grateful to Marada Senderhoff from the uh, National Gallery of Denmark for picking up on this story. Um, these guys gave away, they were infuriated by the constant uh, pirating of their work. They decided, rather than to build a higher wall, to give it all away in high quality and just ask their fans to buy their videos. And did they get a 10% improvement? Did they get a 100% improvement? They got a 23,000% improvement in sales. I don't think I've ever heard of a 20, 20 30,000% improvement in anything before. That, that uh, is startling, but true. Um, and uh, Ted, Ted reached its billionth video view. That's, that's kind of astounding. Um, and, and I'm quite taken with Chris Anderson of Ted's, not wired Chris Anderson, Ted Chris Anderson's thinking about the way video is an accelerant to what he calls uh, crowd accelerated innovation. And uh, he says that there are three, three muscles, three, three things that work here with crowd accelerated innovation with, that fuels this incredible growth of the TED, the TED network, the TED meme. Regardless of how you feel, uh, it's easy to get snarky about it, but it's also uh, easy to get snarky about museum visits and library visits too, isn't it? Uh, so the first thing, three dials on a big wheel. Um, big crowd, clear visibility, transparency, something Wikipedia knows a lot about, and desire which I would call urgency or focus, clearly something you all know about as well. That scales, that starts to scale, and you're going to see that in the examples I lay out again and again and again. Um, and openness in particular, I think TED, I think the TED website and, and video channel are well worth studying for a large number of reasons. Uh, I think they can shed a lot of light on the way that uh, uh, heritage institutions can have that cut and paste web experience and still bring value back to their their, their brands. But uh, he says we've become a little obsessed with this idea of openness. Um, we opened our talks to world to the world. They could have enclosed that brand. They gave it away. Now there are millions of people out there helping spread the ideas. Uh, we opened up the translation program, which has been a phenomenal success. Uh, translated talks into more than 70 languages, thereby tripling our viewership in non-English speaking countries. And then by giving away the TEDx brand, which I thought was crazy. And I'm still a little annoyed by the low quality of some of the TEDx um, talks, or they just don't—they just feel a little awkward to me. But there's uh, in that spew of TEDx, there's some remarkable things happening, and I'm quite taken with the tiny little scale innovation of TEDx in a box. So uh, Idea worked with the TED team to make a, a self-contained unit that could travel securely and not you know, secure theft, but just safely without getting destroyed in the developing world. It includes a couple little, a Pico projector that just runs on D batteries, uh, a DVD player, a couple of uh, video phones uh, preloaded with TED Talks, a little speaker, uh, some other doodads, some scripts and how-to <coughs> advice. And this thing comes in a, in a box, a little armored case about that big, and they just circulate through the developing world. Um, and some of the stories, um, uh, TEDx Kibera, TEDx Iburu, um, this is, I'll, I'll talk about going from zero scale to a scale of one in a little bit, but it's pretty remarkable. I love this page on Wikipedia, and I love talking to museum, library, and archive audiences about this page. And when, you know when you bring this up live, the, the single placeholder and the 10 placeholders, they spin like, like, like lottery um, one-armed bandits. They just blur. It goes so fast. 
And actually, this is up, up more than 100,000 from the last time I checked it. I had to update the slides this morning. Um, and you all are very familiar with the altruistic nonprofit vision that fuels this and the participatory vision. You see something wrong, you fix it. It scales. It scales fluidly and it scales well. And I like comparing, I've been comparing the Wikipedia page for the Smithsonian Spaceship One to the Smithsonian's page for Spaceship One for five or six years now. And it's, it's the gift that keeps on giving. Right now, um, I mean, I think the Smithsonian's page, we just have one curator. We've got 137 million objects. Um, not for that one curator. We have a lot of curators. <laughs> that. Um, but actually, that ratio feels accurate most of the time. The Wikipedia page, the thing that really strikes museum decision makers the most is 400 editors. You know, if you, if you went into your museum staff meeting in the morning and said, we're going to do a new project that's going to have 400 editors, you would be locked up immediately. <laughs> but it works. It works, doesn't it? I mean, you all are living proof that it works and it scales. It scales phenomenally well. It's somehow, I think, due to a large degree to, to Jimmy Wells' vision and your stewardship. Um, and I was browsing some early, uh, early articles about Wikipedia, which are hilarious. The, the doubt and the, the concern about these crazy um, idealists ruining the world. This, um, this is from um, um, the former editor of Encyclopedia Britannica. Remember Encyclopedia Britannica? Remember when that seemed, remember when that, I mean, when that seemed like a real issue. I remember sitting in, in museum and library executive meetings when that was, this was this head to head, oh is it better than Wikipedia, is it, what's going on? Um, the, the quote reads, someone who reads Wikipedia is, and this is 2006, I believe, um, someone who reads Wikipedia is rather in the position of a visitor to a public restroom. You know, it's, hard to, it's hard to imagine someone writing that now, <laughs> although you all, you've probably seen worse. Um, it, may, it may be obviously dirty, so that he knows to exercise great care, or it may seem fairly clean, so that he may be lulled into a false sense of security. What he certainly does not know is who has used the facilities before him. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> um, Zooniverse is also a fun site to talk about scale. It's scaled several orders of magnitude beyond other citizen science participatory sites that we know of. Um, 792,000 plus participants in this project. And if you don't know Zooniverse, it's, de it's definitely worth checking out. Um, it started really because um, there were problems in astronomy and astrophysics for which there wasn't enough data. Oh, you are. My oh, man, thank you. Um, um, there were problems that were, for which there just wasn't enough data. Um, and uh, they, they tried um, doing the Stardust experiment. I think it was slides and slides and slides that needed to be more or less manually uh, investigated to see if there were little pieces of interstellar dust in them, and they got 20,000 slides read. And the principal investigators thought, my god, if we could get people to look at 20,000 slides for dust, what else could we do? Um, they uh, launched the next project, which was the Zooniverse, um, the, the, star, the, the, the project to get human beings to identify the shapes of galaxies, which is something that's difficult to get an algorithm to do. Uh, and literally six hours in, they were collecting 50,000 uh, records an hour from the public, and then the server caught fire. Uh, literally caught fire, the power supply burnt out. Um, but the interesting scale note about that is that that site was designed not by computer scientists or web developers, but by astronomers. It was doable to do something that almost didn't catch fire under that kind of load. And now, of course, it's up all the time. Um, Pretty amazing. So uh, OpenStreetMaps is another great example, which is very often, you probably know, compared to Wikipedia for maps. I just think the sheer numbers of people who, who participate in this and the sheer number of locations is staggering. And it also scales down, because who, who knows your neighborhood better than you do? Certainly not a cartographer, or certainly not a flyover airplane or a satellite. A couple of good inter, inter, um, articles in the Times. This one's back from 2009. It's a huge shift. This is putting mapping where it should be, which is in the hands of local people who know an area well. Uh, that is changing the dynamics of an industry. I would like to see that 
um, engagement by people who know their terrain well, disrupting the dynamics of clams. The sooner the better. Um, and then Kickstarter. This is also a nice parlor game to talk about the scale of Kickstarter. In 2012, 2.2 million people from 177 countries pledged $319 million in change to support 18,000 projects and more. And I do think this was once the exclusive domain of governments and large, cushy philanthropies. Um, no, one, no one thought that this would work. No one. And people still don't really think it would work. Um, people reared on the traditional economic theories of incentive and motivation and profit are apparently quite hostile to the idea of Kickstarter, and yet it works, and yet it moves. Um, it provides something increasingly rare in today's society, a platform for an essentially non-economic transaction, one like you participate in all the time, the kind that builds friendships and communities. Kickstarter is baffling by the tenets of a self-serving marketplace, and it works and works and works and works. Um, it would be impossible to escape a, a range of evidence or argument like this without talking about Europeana. 20 million CC0 records, over 2,400 content provider. Uh, I didn't check that fact this morning. Does anyone know if that's, is it 25 yet? I should edit that right now. Um, and uh, open courseware is another outstanding one. Not just because of the kind of unclamorous success that they enjoy just getting their product out the door every day, despite the critics, but their, their moxie, their attitude, uh, they invested early, they placed the bet on the theory of how they thought this would work. They got lucky and did a lot of smart things and it worked, and they enjoyed 100 million users in their first 10 years. That's a big number. That starts to be um, visible in that scale that we used with the poor old National Gallery of Art. A hundred million served. I love that. And in the next ten years, they won't have a billion. That starts to feel like web scale to me. And that's not um, buying french fries. That's not, that's not uh, doing online banking. Those are, those are meaningful, meaningful experiences that those one billion people are going to have. Um, it's also impossible not to talk about China. I'm trying to, if anyone has great connections in China, I'd love to have them. Um, because the word on the street is that China's building about one muse opening one museum every five days for the last 15 years. Um, someone who was just there told me uh, when they were there for three months, China was opening a museum a day. 300 museums this last year. It's, it's almost un, incomprehensible. That scale, on a scale, I don't even know what to do with. Um, but the evidence is sketchy to me. Uh, there we go. Um, one, for every, one, one every five days for 15 years. <laughs> I don't even know where you get that much bricks and mortar. Um, open library. I love Brewster's line, and these are, I'm quoting Brewster um, from Bone Conversation loosely. Um, without users, our shelves are empty. That starts to scale too. No one knows. Open Library has the same infuriating yet scalable service model that Google does. There's really no one at the other end of the phone. They're starting to be slightly, but it doesn't exist unless people are pumping bits into it and tagging and doing their work. And they don't do that unless the fundamental infrastructure is good. Um, and another, this is also a loose quote, I'll say the paraphrase. Um, of ire directed back, and this is people who know Brewster's work, this is no surprise, uh, the $12 billion academic library budget uh, in the US. That's a lot of money, by the way, $12 billion. Um, the people who are supposed to be doing universal access to knowledge and are getting $12 billion a year to do it are not getting the job done. Um, I think Brewster's model is arguably more scalable than the corporate library model, corporate, by which I mean the organizational model, not corporations. Library Thing is another kind of cool, scalable example. Um, library Thing is, a, is well, um, it's another participatory library. The, the founder, Tim Spaulding, says uh, library isn't an institutional thing. Anyone who has a large co collection of books has a library. 
and it's got about 1.6 million users in there. And Tim tells a very interesting story about the Library of Car Congress um, subject headings are updated, it takes about 10 years to update one. So there's not a subject heading for paranormal romance, apparently. Much to the, this is a big, if you've been in a bookstore in the States, you know this is a big, a big deal, paranormal romance. Um, it takes about a decade for those to roll in, and then once they do, they don't catalog retroactively. So a whole generation will be not able to find their paranormal romance books in official libraries, but library thing just rolls it. It just rolls it like a wiki. It just, it just makes up the new subject heading as needed. It scales. Um, and in the middle of this bestiary of me trying to find things that scale and don't scale and trying to figure out how the physics of it works, I, there, someone al almost always raises their hand and says, yeah, that's great, Smithsonian guy. <laughs> Jerk. Um, you work for the world's largest museum and research complex. It's fine for you to talk about scale, but I work for the, 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 the rural museum of left-handed earrings. And there's one curator, I think the average staff size for an American museum is one or two people. Um, when the American Association of Museum reports their statistics and, and the, the funding, they don't use averages, they use medians because they're a couple of huge museums and then everyone else is a mom and pop shop. But I think, I, I think and I'm still building this case, uh, building, gathering evidence and trying to make sure the case works, um, it's actually the scale problem is a problem for big institutions who are used to doing stuff in the broadcast idiom. And I think it's easier for small organizations. Most of the examples I just laid out, maybe with the exception of MIT, um, uh, don't require big teams to do. Uh, Public.resource.org is Carl Malamud, who works in a, he ran space at O'Reilly Media in Sebastopol, California. And Carl and a couple of volunteers, their total budget is $500,000 a year. But on the side, they have a hobby of taking, asking federal workers, federal agencies, to send them their old videos, and they rip them and upload them to YouTube. Carl is, there are only three federal agencies that upload more video, more government video than Carl does. Um, Carl has 20 million views on YouTube, another 20 million on the Internet Archive, uh, bigger than all but three video agencies in online video. And he's doing this with a couple of volunteers and his own spare time. It's very impressive. Another kind of lightweight scaling uh, team is Smart History, SM Art History. Um, and that's run by two people, uh, art historians who became frustrated with the paucity of good <coughs> art information online. And they said, and these are also. Um, well, this is the kind of the boilerplate quote for them. Uh, Smart History is a free, nonprofit, multimedia web book designed as dynamic enhancement or even substitute for traditional art history textbooks. They, um, I'm skipping it, skipping my, skipping, uh, I thought the next quote was a different one, but they have uh, 512 videos, 247 essays, 6 million visits viewed in 200 countries. Their tech budget is 700 bucks and a couple laptops. You know, as far as I know, they're the largest art information video publisher and probably the most visited art information, one of the most visited sites in the world. And they kind of do it in their jammies on the <laughs> laptops, 700 bucks a year, I think, for tables and stuff. Um, this is the YouTube view. Um, and Beth Cantor said, paraphrase, I mean, Beth Harris said, paraphrase, as professors, we reach 200 students a semester. Last semester, as far as I can tell, smart history content reached 750,000 individuals. That starts to feel good to me. That starts to feel like 10 times improvement, what's possible. Um, and as I've been looking through these examples, okay, there's something that can be done faster and kind of magnified impact done this way that doesn't work the other way. I think there are a couple special cases in scale, special exceptions, and I'm, I'm working new to find new words for them um, so they can be shaped into a tool that you can use to get stuff done. Um, Ethan Zuckerman gave a very interesting talk at the Digital Media Learning Conference uh, just this year, I think it was in February, and, and he came up with this, this construct, this this grid of engagement. And it goes like this. Um, quadrants. So uh, from thin to thick, 
engagement or involvement and from symbolic to impactful. This, this help, has helped me sort out some things I didn't have language for about uh, things that scale but feel easy. Um, thumbs up on Facebook, you know, that's very easy. It doesn't actually accomplish much. Um, versus things that are very personal and tactile, crying in front of the Vermeer at this is beautiful, 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 beautiful museum. Um, so uh, the upper left is the slacktivism quadrant, is what uh, Ethan calls it. So that's, yeah, um, I mean, when I was in college, we were all protesting apartheid by standing in front of the president's house for 10 minutes. But it was very thin, it didn't require much of us, and it was very symbolic. And we didn't actually bother to read policies or talk to board members. We just, you know, we were just angry at our parents or something. Um, thin and impactful, Ethan says. Ethan says voting is supposed to be thin. It's supposed to be really easy. But because of all the other structures of, of, of business analysts might call them business rules, uh, it's very impactful. It's supposed to be easy. It's very fluid. Um, uh, symbolic and thick. Thick is messy, hard, requires a lot of effort. A lot is asked of you to do that. Is the Occupy movement. Um, symbolic, because they're not, they're not really, most of them, hacking policies or, or uh, working on long-lasting social change that ratchets up and doesn't slip down. But then um, the Occupy movement in New York after Hurricane Sandy turned into a, a really serious civic action disaster relief organization. They got good at symbolic and thick. That gave them tools and reflexes and communication network that made them an incredibly, maybe the most effective relief agency in the days after Sandy. And I cannot, I'm only a few hundred miles from New York. Um, I was up at a conference of New York educators in January and I, what I learned about what it was really like in New York in the aftermath of Sandy humbled me greatly. It's a lot different than the evening news. Um, and Ethan observed that the, the things that are in the slacktivism quadrant are easy to scale. They get, they get big numbers very quickly. Um, but it's hard to take those down to the very impactful thick. Those tend to want to be one-to-one, -one, they said high-touch interactions. Um, a curator and three people, an educator and three people, a classroom, one-to-one -one instruction. And part of what Ethan's working on for um, participatory democracy, and I think part of what we're all working on in, in change, in these institutions that I'm here to represent in some ways, we, we believe in having impact in the world. Um, we want that to scale more. We want some of the good stuff, the easy, fluid stuff that happens in the upper left to carry down to the lower right, and we're not sure exactly how that happens yet. But now that I have a name for it, 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 it helps. Um, so, an, another two quick ideas here. I think scale has a z-axis. That's really geeky for a guy who wasn't good at math or geometry, but um, by the z-axis, I mean personal depth, uh, in personal impact. The National Gallery of Art, hypothetically, they have 4.6 million visitors. If they're really touching, changing, those 4.6 million visitors, I'm totally happy with that. If that's part of their concept of scale, is to penetrate more deeply into those lives and have that, that uh, impact and affectation go both ways, read right, to make the organization itself better and more caring and more better at what it does, and that's wonderful. That's operating on the z-axis. A lovely uh, example I found uh, of kind of high touch, um, impactful, was uh, the, the human lending library in the Toronto Public Library. This is apparently something that came out of Copenhagen in the 70s to help, help deal with um, some ethnic tension in Copenhagen, but you register with the library and then people check you out. <laughs> and sit and talk with you. It's a wonderful idea. Toronto is the most, if I understand correctly, the most used library system in the world. Um, and then zero to one. I think there's a special, we have to reserve a special place, especially in our thinking in the developed world, thinking about the rest of the world. And actually, no, that's not true. I'm going to take that away. Um, in all of our work, all of our thinking as human beings about zero to one, going from total absence of something to any of it, is its own kind of scale and is worth is worthy of intense 
societal shared effort. Um, I've been learning about a, a nonprofit called Room to Read. John Wood was a Microsoft executive flying high in the 90s when that was like, the coolest thing to be doing in the world. Uh, and he took a, a three-week backpacking trip in Nepal. And he's, he said he even felt kind of uh, self-conscious about it, that he, he found himself there. He was invited to visit a school that had three books, and they kept them locked up so that the kids wouldn't ruin them. And I can't, I, I don't remember the third. One was a Danielle Steele paperback. And then one was Finnegan's Wake. <laughs> and these were treasured books. Um, Nepal apparently has a fairly well organized ministry of education. They have teachers, they have schools, they're just poor. They have a hunger for learning, but they're at zero. And they asked him, would you bring some books back next time you come? And he said, sure. And he thought and thought and thought, and he didn't want to be that guy who didn't do that. And he sent an email. Email can be pretty viral. Sent an email to everyone in his address book saying, do you have old board books lying around your house? Um, anything in English these people will use. It doesn't have to be in, in, in any other language. And uh, send them to my dad in Colorado. And in a week, his dad called and said, I've got 3,000 books in my garage. <laughs> um, Room to Read just gave away its 10 millionth book. They publish now native language books for a buck. He's got a funny chapter in his most recent book called, uh, the chapter is, We Don't Drive Range Rovers. So for 75, they drive Hyundais out in the field for a $75,000 Range Rover. He can print 75,000 native language books. Um, he can educate a girl for a year for $250. I can't do that math now, but that's a lot of, one Range Rover is a lot of education. Um, so 10 million books they just gave away, five years ahead of schedule. Um, 15,000 libraries they built, 15,000 libraries. And they insist on partnering with the local communities. They have to want it. And often that means paying $8 a family or something, which is an enormous wage. One of the stories, I was trying to find a 100 pound, a 50 kilo bag of concrete to bring today. But one of his stories is in a town so poor, up in the mountains, I think about a thousand or two thousand feet up from the, the, the trailhead, the place where trucks could get to. The local women, who were too poor to donate money, every day they would carry concrete bags, 50 kilos, from where the truck dropped them off to the school. That's how they contributed that. John Wood said, big American guy who lifted weights couldn't even lift one of those bags up off the ground. And I wanted to see if any of us had, can I say, had, had the balls had the temerity to carry one fucking bag of concrete up these stairs. You know, these people are desperate for access to information in a way that I just can't even, in a way that's very moving and, and humbling to me. Um, and we ought to, frankly, help them get it. Um, another example there, this was a beautiful essay. Oh, my, out of sequence here, I think the title, yeah, Caitlin Morin. Who's very well known columnist here, yes? I have not, yeah. not heard of her. So you've all probably seen this essay. Um, Everything I Am is based on this ugly building and its lonely lawn, the library. Lit up during winter darkness, open in the slashing rain, which allowed a girl so poor she didn't even own a purse to come in twice a day and experience actual magic, traveling through time, making contact with the dead. A little library in the middle of a community is a cross between an emergency exit, a life raft, and a festival. <laughs> No new libraries will be built to replace them. These libraries will be lost forever. And in their place, we will have thousands more public spaces where you are simply the money in your pocket rather than the hunger in your heart. Kids, poor kids, will never know the fabulous, benign quirk of self-esteem of walking into their library and thinking, I've read 60% of the books in here. and awesome. <laughs> libraries that stayed open during the blitz will be closed by budgets. A trillion small doors closing. So we do, I love my museums, libraries, and archives, and I, I want them to be successful. They have amazing missions. They have amazing missions that have lasted for hundreds and hundreds of years and are still as relevant now as they were when Nelson sailed the seas. Um, but I think we need them to be super successful. I think we need them to succeed at scale with an urgency that's appropriate for this moment on this particular planet. 
put the tools of knowledge creation into more hands, share the joy and meaning of artistic and cultural exploration with more citizens, deepen engagement with the challenges that face our species, and nurture the habits of a civil and sustainable society. And this is our job. This is the job of these institutions. You put resources in one end, and you're supposed to get those things out the other at scale, as good as you can get. But can we do it quickly enough and at big enough scale to make a substantial difference in the lives of individuals and the fate of our species? The old way of doing things, I love this picture of people viewing the Mona Lisa. The old way isn't necessarily better. It's good. It can be good. But it doesn't always work. You know, museum visits aren't always the, 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 the paragon, the archetype of learning in this way. If, if you ever, as a Wikipedian, if any, anyone ever grabs you by the ears and says, the only good things that happen in museums and libraries are people sitting with books and looking at paintings, don't take it for a second. Don't, 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 don't stand for that for a second. So I'm going to wind it up. I do think scale is very confusing. Scale is a very confusing thing. We evolved for hundreds of thousands of generations, not really needing to know much beside the 120 people in our clan. It's very hard to think about 10 or 20 million people, let alone 3.4, let alone 7 billion people. Um, and, and is, of the our billion TED videos, better than 2.4 visits, 2.4 million visits to the National Gallery of Art? Well, not necessarily. But I assert that the vast difference in scale is evidence that something really important is going on that's worth paying attention to. Um, there are definitely more powerful ways of, of, of meeting the missions, supersizing the missions of galleries, libraries, archives, and museums than the way we've done it for the last several hundred years. And I'll close with this um, a set of ideas from Larry Page from Google, uh, a Wired Magazine interview. Uh, the writer writes, Page expects his employees to create products and services that are 10 times better than the competition. 10 times better. That's a thousand percent. That's not ten percent better. Ten times better. That means he isn't satisfied with discovering a couple of hidden efficiencies or tweaking code to achieve modest gains. Thousand percent improvement requires rethinking problems entirely, exploring the edges of what's technically possible, and having a lot more fun in the process. Yeah, that's wired for you. Um, so Paige writes, Paige speaks to the interviewer, says, We have all this money at Google. Yeah, they certainly do. <laughs> um, and we don't, for us. Uh, we have all these people. Why aren't we doing more stuff? You may say that Apple only does a very, very small number of things, and it's working pretty well for them. It's a boutique. We're a boutique. But I find that unsatisfying. I feel like there are all these opportunities in the world to use technology to make people's lives better. At Google, we're attacking maybe one-tenth of one percent of that space. And all the tech companies combined are only at like 1%. That means there's 99% virgin territory. So I say let's go count. Thank you.